It was New Year's Day, 1929, when a brief but terrifying wireless message was received in Edmonton. Diphtheria. Fear epidemic. Send antitoxin. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happen in your own backyard, the podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes, with your host and author, Andrew McLean. Two men had set out two weeks earlier by a dog sled over the vast icy wilderness to deliver that message to the nearest wireless station. One man had died on the Odyssey. A worker for the Hudson Bay Company had recently been transferred to the remote community of Little Red River, home to approximately 200 people. He was still on packing when he abruptly became very ill and died. His wife, a nurse, recognized his symptoms, diphtheria. Today, we are vaccinated against diphtheria as babies, and it is effectively extinct in Canada. Back then, though, it was a highly contagious and fast-spreading disease. In two days, victims could go from having a slight cough to a massively swollen white and gray spotted neck that would cut off their breathing, killing many who were afflicted with it. However, there was a cure. But the outbreak was in remote northern Saskatchewan, some 800 kilometers north of Edmonton. The nearest doctor was 80 kilometers away in Fort Vermilion, and he had no medicine. In Edmonton, when the message was received, panicked health officials, fearing the beginning of a wider pandemic, sprang into action immediately, even though it was a holiday. They rushed all around the city, quickly assembling all the antitoxins they could gather. Curing the disease during an outbreak was not as simple as vaccinating a baby against it. And health officials had to assemble a staggering 600,000 doses to inoculate the 200 people in Little Red River. Assembling those 600,000 doses was actually the easy part. The hard part would be getting them to Little Red River. Flying was the ideal option, but flying over 800 kilometers in the dead of winter, beginning on New Year's Day, when the weather was minus 33, would require a pilot who was either very brave or who did not value his life and limb. Fortunately for the people of Little Red River, such a pilot could be readily found. This was, after all, the age of the bush pilot. Many of the bush pilots striving to make Canada a less immense country were ace pilots from the Great War, as the First World War was known at the time. They were flying antiquated war surplus biplanes, navigating with often inaccurate maps, and learning how to patch up their plane as they went, using everything from shoelaces to tin cans. It wasn't unheard of to actually have to whittle a new propeller for the plane themselves. Edmonton was home to several pilots who had been famous a decade earlier during the war. This included Wilford Wap May and Roy Brown, who had combined to shoot down Manfred von Richthofen, the famous Red Baron. Perhaps saying that they combined to kill the Red Baron wasn't exactly evenly distributing the credit though. In reality, the novice young Wap May, on his second ever combat flight, found himself being pursued by the most famous, feared, and deadly pilot of all, the Red Baron. Panicking, the inexperienced May began flying erratically. This wasn't on purpose, he claimed later, but this was because he didn't know any better. Meanwhile, his squadron commander, Roy Brown, proud of his record of having never lost a pilot, swooped down to rescue his newest pilot by sneaking up behind the Red Baron, who was focused on following May's erratic flying, and then shooting him once right through the heart, killing him instantly. Roy Brown insisted both men share credit for the demise of the Red Baron, while May has always insisted that the commander saved his life. After the war, 
Wat May founded a flight company in Edmonton. It quickly went bankrupt. See, Edmonton was very reluctant to fly, considerably much more so than other Canadian cities at the time. Edmonton actually refused to build an airport, and the city council considered flying to be a mere passing fad. Despite his bankruptcy, and his wartime heroics being more than a decade behind him, May was determined to keep flying. He eventually started another company with a fellow veteran pilot from the First World War named Vic Horner. They were not very successful. It was just the two of them, and they just had one single old Avro Avian biplane, and the plane was not equipped for winter, and it wasn't even enclosed. The pilots just sat with their heads up in the freezing cold wind. It was not a good situation to be flying in minus 33 degree weather on New Year's Day. This was the duo that the Deputy Minister of Health reached out to to ask to do the risky flight. Despite being completely unequipped for it, they immediately accepted. The next day, shortly after noon, health officials met the duo by their plane and handed off the life-saving medicines. The 600,000 doses were packaged in a single crate wrapped in a wool blanket. In minus 33 degree weather, the two pilots departed. The flight was so risky that health authorities contacted every local radio station to tell people in remote locations to keep an eye out for the plane and to search for it if it crashed. The radio was a new invention that had quickly become popular that decade. It was life-changing for people in remote areas. Now even the most isolated hunters, trappers, and farmers could be kept in the loop with news from the rest of Canada. Word spread quickly from station to station all over Canada of the dangerous flight to deliver life-saving medicine. All over the country, people keenly awaited the latest news. Any snippets of word of their progress were radioed from isolated posts back from Edmonton or were quickly relayed all over the nation. In fact, my own grandfather, who was then just a five-year-old boy from a poor family in the small community of Tidehead, New Brunswick, was one person tuned in. He was eagerly following along with what was being called the race against death. Decades later, he would still talk of the sense of excitement and the sense of hope across the nation during that flight. Mere hours into their flight, disaster struck. They looked back and there was smoke pouring out of the rear compartment where the medicines were stored. The duo quickly made an emergency landing. It turned out that the wool blanket the medicines were wrapped in had caught fire. The two men extinguished the fire by throwing the burning blanket into the snow. They realized that the source of the fire was their heater, which was now broken. Even worse, if the medicines froze, they wouldn't work. The two men stuffed the medicines into their clothes, under their armpits, in their groins, to keep it warm with their own body heat. Then they took off again in the freezing weather. After several hours of flying, darkness set in and there was a looming snowstorm and they were forced to land in McLennan. McLennan had no airport and few places did. The health authorities had wired ahead instructing the people of McLennan to clear snow off of a nearby lake to make a makeshift landing strip. The duo spent the night there and they left early the next morning. They had to go all the way to Peace River to refuel. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of Canada, in New Brunswick, the Telegraph Journal newspaper followed their progress and they said, quote unquote, it was 33 below at Peace River. It was almost unbearably cold in the aeroplane. The men were numb from the cold when they were lifted from their seats. After gassing up in Peace River, they were off again. Their maps were of questionable use in the snow, but they were able to follow along some train tracks. They successfully arrived in their destination of Fort Vermilion, where they were able to give the life-saving medicine to the lone doctor in town, who himself was showing symptoms of the disease. 
The doctor then began to travel 80 kilometers by dog sled with the medicines to Little Peace River. Their flight back to Edmonton was even more dangerous for the two men. They had gotten sick on the flight because of the cold, and the weather was getting worse. Their plane was in bad shape, and it had terrible engine problems. Despite the delays and the mission being completed, the public was still breathlessly following their progress as they made their return. When they made it back to Edmonton, a crowd of an astonishing 10,000 people were waiting for them to land. The Telegraph Journal reported, quote-unquote, breaking through the police lines, thousands of people started for WAP and Vic. The plane was halted. The aviators were taken from their seats, hoisted on sturdy shoulders, and paraded a distance of 500 yards to the hangar, where they had the opportunity to warm themselves before a fire that had been especially built for them. The medicine saved hundreds of lives. In the end, the only deaths were the HBC employee and the dog sled driver who had died getting the message out. May capitalized on his heroics by launching another flying company called Commercial Airlines. Unlike his previous efforts, this company became successful, bringing people and goods all over Canada's north. Meanwhile, the people of Edmonton were finally convinced that flying was here to stay. Soon after, their city council voted to spend $33,000 to build the city's first airport. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thank you for listening and tune in next week for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Backyard.